Hello and welcome to MaryCast. This is Dr. Mark Mirvali, Professor of Theology and Mariology at the Franciscan University of Stumville. My friends, as we go back in history to the event of Pentecost, um, not just on the solemnity of Pentecost or anything close to that, but throughout the liturgical year, uh, it's fruitful for us to ponder what happens in that upper room and why the Spirit comes with the power and with the force that He does come in bringing a definitive birth to the church. Well, one efficient cause for Pentecost, one reason for its existence, one reason it is so powerful is precisely the prayers of the Blessed Virgin Mary. John Paul II put it simply, he said, Mary was particularly instrumental in the descent of the Holy Spirit because it was the calling of one spouse to another. Now that's profound stuff. I mean, our Blessed Mother is praying in the upper room with the greatest apostles and disciples, praying for the Holy Spirit. Jesus has ascended into heavenly glory. The Mother prays because she knows, A, that the disciples need the Holy Spirit, and B, that uh, the disciples around her have important things to do, and they're going to need that powerful Spirit to guide them in bringing forth the evangelization of the church. Well, my friends, I believe in a similar situation right now. I believe that we are on the brink of a new Pentecost. Uh, I believe, as Pope Benedict called us to pray when he visited the United States, we're to, we're, we're to call, we're to pray, we're to petition for a new Pentecost. Uh, and we, we should not be discouraged by the darkness of today, the darkness in families, marriages breaking, children losing faith, abortions, um, natural disasters in unprecedented degrees, uh, world conflict, the peacelessness throughout the world, the peacelessness in hearts. No, that's a reality, but it doesn't take away our hope for a new Pentecost. Uh, you know, John the 23rd at the Second Vatican Council called for a new descent of the Spirit, a new Pentecost for the Church. Uh, and we have every reason to believe that with these vicars of Christ, with these holy popes, we are to expect a true descent of the Holy Spirit. But it's not going to happen without Mary. It's a, it's a replay in a real sense of what takes place in the early church but now the mother calls down the Holy Spirit in a powerful way. I want to go briefly to the theology of St. Maximilian Kolbe because it's so extremely powerful in understanding the union between the Holy Spirit and our Blessed Mother. St. Maximilian says that the relationship between the Holy Spirit and Mary, while spousal, really des de deserves a, a deeper analogy, if you will. Uh, he says spousal uh, relationship between the Holy Spirit and Mary is true, but he says it's too weak. Now, for all spouses, one realizes, well, that's a strong statement. A spousal relationship is, is, is such a strong, and is called to be such a strong relationship. But St. Maximilian says that, that between the Holy Spirit and Mary, it's, it's true they're spouses, but if you really want to get at the heart of how united the Spirit and the Bride are, you have to compare them to the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means that as the divine nature and the human nature are inseparably united in the one divine person in Jesus, that's the best way of thinking of the relationship between the Holy Spirit and Mary. That it's like the Holy Spirit is incarnate in Mary. It's like, he says. It's a personification. Mary is a personification of this Spirit. Now, St. Maximilian, Maximilian, being a, a brilliant theologian and a saint, immediately makes the important distinctions. He says that with the Holy Spirit and Mary, you don't have a hypostatic union in the sense that there's two separate persons. There's the Holy Spirit as a divine person, there's Mary as a human person. Secondly, St. Maximilian tells us that the Holy Spirit never became incarnate. Having said that, he then says, but if the Holy Spirit became incarnate, it would be Mary. So, Mary is a type of quasi-incarnation, an almost incarnation of the Holy Spirit. And hopefully that helps us realize why, as we look at Scripture, if we look at the Bible, we see that where Mary goes, the Spirit goes, and grace happens. 
Well, Mary says yes. What happens at the Annunciation? Luke 1.38, Mary says, Be it done unto me according to thy word. The Holy Spirit overshadows her. And what happens? Jesus happens. That's an, an incredible divine, human, supernatural formula. If it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That, that continues. Where Mary goes, the Spirit goes. So look at the first journey Mary takes. She goes to the hill country to An Karim to visit Elizabeth. What happens? Where Mary goes, the Spirit goes. As soon as Elizabeth hears Mary, you have a prophecy that, Mar that the Holy Spirit overshadows, in that sense, Elizabeth too. And you have the child in Elizabeth's womb jumping. Why? Because the Spirit sanctifies John in the womb. Where Mary goes, the Spirit goes. And that continues all throughout Scripture until the end of Revelation, where it says, the Spirit and the Bride say, come. So, St. Maximilian is inspired when he says that we should think of the Holy Spirit and Mary so united that it's like the hypostatic union, like the divine and human natures in the one divine person of Jesus. Now, let's, let's take the brilliance of Maximilian, of St. Maximilian, and bring it to our situation now. Well, now we need a new Pentecost. How are we going to get a new Pentecost? We're going to get a new Pentecost by doing proper tribute to the mother by proclaiming the truth about the mother, by giving the mother a dogmatic crown. Conceive it this way, if, if you're a visual person, think of a dove entrapped in the Immaculate Heart. Think of our Blessed Mother's heart and think of a cage in the heart. And think of the, a dove entrapped in the heart. Now, of course, the Holy Spirit is divine. Of course, the Holy Spirit can do what He wants. But in the order of providence, in the order of how God has arranged it, the Holy Spirit will not descend until the mother is recognized. So in other words, when the mother is recognized in the proclamation of the dogma, when she's solemnly pronounced as the spiritual mother of all peoples, then and only then the Holy Spirit will be freed to mediate through her in bringing the graces of redemption and, and a new redemption to humanity, to bring the graces of a new Pentecost to humanity. And St. Maximilian, again, is so one in this thought, he says, the Holy Spirit is the source of all graces. Mary is the instrument of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit acts only through the Immaculata. Ponder what that means. The Holy Spirit, by, not by necessity, but by divine disposition, acts only through the Immaculata. So, she is the mediatrix of each and every grace of the Holy Spirit. That means when you get the dogma, and my friends, it's not if, it's when. So keep it in your prayers and your sacrifices. When? A Holy Father makes a proclamation of the dogma. We should be praying it's this Holy Father. When that takes place, when the mother is acknowledged, the Holy Spirit, the cage will be opened. The Holy Spirit, the dove will fly out of the Immaculate Heart of Mary and historic graces will come upon a church and a world in need of these graces by the day. So, pray for a new Pentecost. Pray for a new descent of the Holy Spirit. Pray for the proclamation of the dogma that will allow the Spirit to pass through the mediatrics of all graces and sanctify the church and the world. And pray for our Holy Father that He will see this as the ultimate remedy for the unjust attack on Him as well. We need a new Pentecost. Heaven is waiting. Our Blessed Mother is the mediatrix of each and every gift of the Holy Spirit. Give her our yes through this proclamation of the dogma and let the Holy Spirit bring forth a new period of grace and peace for the world. Mark Mervalli with Mary Cast. Thanks for being with me. God bless.